Hello, hello uh, to you all and welcome for uh, uh, this uh, session. Uh, session of very, on a very uh, hot uh, topic, uh, we'll be uh, talking uh, about the uh, supra-ultra power of uh, the uh, big platforms, uh, uh, the GAFAM, as we, uh, as we name them in the US, but in, in Asia now also we have uh, quite a, a, a big groups like uh, Tencent, Baidu, uh, Alibaba, of course. Uh, in, unfortunately, in Europe, uh, companies are lagging behind and uh, quite none of these companies are really uh, influent in, the, in this arena. And uh, one of the main response we have now in Europe is, is regulation. So we'll be talking about that. Uh, what is this regulation for? Is it helpful? Does it help innovation? Uh, does it help uh, 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 the emergence of big uh, supra uh, Euro European champions? Uh, and for uh, this session, we have uh, uh, quite a, a great panel. Uh, I'm very proud to, to moderate this panel today. We have uh, Thierry Breton, a European Commissioner for uh, uh, Internal Markets, uh, Bengt Elström, Nobel Prize, and a professor at uh, the MIT, uh, Luc Julia, Chief uh, Scientific Officer, just uh, joined the, the Group Renault, uh, and uh, Jacques Kremer, professor at the uh, uh, Toulouse School of Economics. And we'll start with you, uh, uh, Jacques. Um, you've been studying this topic, of course, for many years now. And uh, so what is your reflection of, uh, on, on the actual situation? Well, it's, it's, it's a very strange situation because uh, in some sense, we're all in love with big tech. I mean, if uh, Apple announces a new iPhone, you've got uh, queues Mm. Uh, for 24 hours or 48 hours waiting for the new iPhone. Uh, if you spend uh, two hours on Facebook uh, a day, you are not even considered a, an addict. Uh, everybody uses Google, mm -hmm. or nearly everybody uses Google in order to access news, to access the internet, to find information. So uh, big tech has... Is part of our lives, and we all became early adopters, right? We, yeah, <laughs> but even late adopters, you know. Yeah. I remember my uh, mother telling me, "Oh, Google isn't that fantastic when when it uh, when it appeared." So there's there's really this enthusiasm about mm. big tech, okay? And we mm. we use it, uh, we like it, okay? So that's at our individual life, okay? People use uh, Alexa, except you know to speak to big tech or uh, mm. uh, Amazon Echo, you know to speak to big tech, uh, and you know think it's normal to have a kind of a, kind of you know, a friendly relationship with it. Mm. And then on the political level and on the media level. Big tech is the big nasty guys, okay? Mm. Uh, they're taking over our lives, they're taking our data, mm. they don't leave us any choice, they keep us prisoner. So we've got this, this big tension, mm. uh, I think, in society, uh, which is creating lots of interesting ripples uh, in the discussions of what policy to have. Yes. So the, uh, Europe has taken uh, the lead in the trying to uh, moderate the bad aspects mm -hmm. of uh, big tech. So I played a very, very minor role uh, about three years ago when I uh, helped write a report for the European Commission on how should competition policy mm -hmm. be reformed. Uh, and then uh, Europe has decided actually to go further than this, that managing competition wasn't enough. Mm -hmm. uh, we should regulate uh, competition. And uh, Commissioner Breton has been at, uh, one of the people at the forefront of this yeah. effort to create new regulations mm -hmm. uh, for big tech. So there are really interesting questions about how do we regulate big tech, lower the bad aspects, uh, while not losing the good aspects. Okay? Mm -hmm. And then there's a secondary question, which I think is very important and I hope we'll discuss, is uh, Europe is it seems to me clearly behind in terms of regulation, in terms of innovation, especially in uh, big tech. And I hope we will have a discussion also. Of, uh, clearly, regulation is not going to be enough yeah. to uh, promote European innovation. Yeah. What else should we do in order to promote European innovation? So I'm really looking forward to this discussion uh, with the commissioner, with uh, my old friend Bank, yes. and uh, with uh, Luc Julia. Good, and uh, we are very happy and honored to have uh, Thierry Breton with us tonight, uh, today. Uh, hello, uh, hello, uh, Mr. Breton, uh, live from your office in, uh, in, uh, in, in Brussels. 
Uh, what's interesting in your role is that you are today, uh, you play a main role, of course, on, on, in all these aspects uh, today as, as commissioner, but you've been, you have been leading big French companies in the tech area for, 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 for most of your career. So you have the, this very good comprehension and you know what regulation is. Um, how does it help? I mean, uh, what's the, the, the aim, the goal of, of, of these regulations? And, and does it really help to slow down the, these uh, big tech giants? Well, good, uh, good afternoon, good morning, good evening, everyone, from where you stand. Uh, um, first, um, Mr. Fontaine, I would like to react a little bit with your presentation. Mm -hmm. You said in Europe, we don't have big tech companies, but we have regulation. I, I, and I know this is a marronnier. I know that this is <laughs> a, 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 some common sense, and, 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 and I know that uh, you keep repeating this, even if uh, I could tell you that it's probably not the case, and I will try to demonstrate this to you, but still. Um, you know, I, 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 I don't... I don't feel comfortable uh, with uh, the way uh, this has been presented, um, because... I don't consider that my job as being in charge of digital in, in addition to, um, to the single market is not to regulate. It is just to organize it. And it's not against anybody. Mm -hmm. So myself, I will not speak about um, GAFAM or BATIX or whatever. I will just speak about the necessity that as politicians, we just have to put some rules in our digital space, because of course we did it in the physical space, we did this in the sea space, we did this in the air space, and now of course we have to do it also in the digital or information space. That's my job, mm. because in this space a lot of activity occurs. Of course, our social life, cultural life, political life, economical life, and if we listen to our people, our fellow citizens, by the way, everywhere on the planet, not only in Europe, including, by the way, in the US. We all remember what happened for capital. <laughs> we just hear that there is a need to organize our digital space. And this is exactly what, have, what I will do and what I'm doing with our Digital Services Act and our DMA, Digital mm -hmm. Market Act. Let's come with the first one. The first one is just, again, to put some rules to make sure that, in a nutshell, realize and organize the fact that everything which is forbidden offline is forbidden online, mm -hmm. and everything which is accepted offline is accepted online. Mm -hmm. Simple sentence, simple words, not easy to do but mandatory to do, against no one, just for our people. So, and by the way, when I'm listening to what's happened in the States, it's exactly the same question. The second story is, okay, but in this new information space, digital space, call it the way you want. Moi, je l'appelle plutôt l'espace informationnel. But, okay, feel free to do it. You understand exactly what I mean. We just need also here to make sure we have some rules and to make sure that we have a fair competition, not against anybody, because the last one we organized our digital space was in early 2000. You, need, you remember the directive e-commerce, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. more than 20 years ago. So what we are doing now is organizing probably the rules for the next 10 to 20 years. And here, of course, we have to make sure that we will have fair competition, just fair competition. Because this is what we need for to innovate and to avoid, uh, let's say, uh, predatory behaviors, to avoid uh, gatekeepers' behaviors. And it is here also against no one. Because at the end of the day, even if we miss, I will conclude that here, mm -hmm. even if we miss, that's absolutely certain, the first wave of the data evolution slash revolution, the personal data. I am convinced that the new one which is coming now the so-called industrial data, which is much higher, much bigger than the one we had to cope with. And I'm sure that Mr. Julia being now at Mono will understand exactly what I mean. <laughs> we will, for this one, believe me, 
we are, and I will tell you, better position than probably everyone. And this is where I will focus my effort. And I want to organize this space to make sure that competition will allow everyone to be able to innovate and to expand themselves. But I, will, I may come back later on if you want on the sure. DMA. But that's basically what I want to say. It's not against anybody. You will never listen to me saying it's against this or that. Mm -hmm. Because within the next five to ten years, you know what? I am sure that you will see a new players in the industrial data space. Unbelievable. Mm -hmm. Very powerful. By the way, I have already two or three ideas of companies in Europe. But I will keep this from, from me because I don't want to make you <laughs> Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Breton. Um, and and um, I'm, I'm sure uh, Bank will have a lot to, 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 to say about what you just said. Hi, Bank. Uh, live from, uh, Hi. from Boston, from, uh, from, uh, from the MIT. Um, can you hear us, Bank? Yes. Yeah, good. Um, so you just heard the commissioner. And of course, these are topics that you've studied for, for, for many, many years. You're still looking at that very closely. Um, what do you think about the situation now? Uh, I mean, just not only in Europe. Uh, Europe is, of, of, of course, our main topic tonight, today. But what, what is the, uh, what, 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 uh, how can you react to just to, uh, Thierry Boutson just said? Well, I think first thing to say, I think there's a, there's a real discontinuity that has happened in the last two years or so. Maybe Luke will tell, uh, it's even earlier, but, but I think something very special is going on. And, and what has happened in my one way of putting it, data has become a wealth driver. Yeah, that's one of the big things. And, and, you know, so we are talking about regulating data a lot, privacy and so on. So that's, so digitization, which has been with us for much longer, is not really the new thing, new kid on the lot. It's the it's the value of data and the concern about the privacy of data and so on. So that's what we are talking about. I think in the use of data, Europe is definitely behind. You know, China, China hasn't even been mentioned here. China is really ahead of a lot of places. U.S. is U.S. is also and and so I would I would. I would not be very casual about the fact that that, that Europe is actually falling behind. Uh, and and uh, the question to me is, uh, is, you know, what are they going to do about it? Is regulation, and I appreciate that we shouldn't perhaps use the word regulation, organization, but it's a little bit semantic. You know, that is what, what it, that's how Europe portrays itself in this space, uh, for good or for bad. That's the way people look at it. Uh, let me just say some facts that are disturbing. Uh, one of which is that among the top 10 biggest companies or most valuable companies of the world, there, is, there, is, uh, there, are, there are no Europeans or EU companies. Mm. Uh, and and uh, they are, they are uh, you know, I think seven or eight, uh, depending on when we measure, seven or eight US and, and a couple of Chinese, so they have fallen in value recently. So it keeps changing. Uh, uh, the other thing that uh, that is true is that seven of those ten are platform businesses. Mm -hmm. There's not a there's not anywhere in sight. SAP, I believe, is the highest value platform business in Europe, and it, it's not. I don't think it's even in the top twenty. So you know there are some facts here about you know what. But it's not because there's less people in Europe. There's more people in Europe than in the U.S., for instance. But, but so we have to, I think, be realistic about this fact. Uh, the most shocking data that recently came uh, on the page is, is, uh, is that when you look at the top 100 most valuable startups in the world, and this is just, uh, I would say, in January or somewhere it came out, uh, there is not a single Central European company in that. Uh, take out Switzerland, but uh, but uh, I'm talking about EU. Uh, the two companies from EU are actually Klarna in Sweden and Bolt in, in Estonia. Mm -hmm. 51 of them are in the US. I'm talking now companies that haven't had a trade sale or haven't gone IPO, meaning that you know they haven't exited, so to speak. So, what it tells 
me is not actually that there are no startups in, in, in Europe, because I know there are in Finland, say, Supercell is a valuable company, but it sell, sold itself out to the Chinese, so it's not in this statistic. And, and so it seems like European companies don't grow in Europe. They sell themselves out somewhere, and I'm sure Luke has something, a lot to tell. But that's the typical pattern. There's actually now a Portuguese company that just entered this data. So if you look at it today, mm-hmm. Portugal has a big. Uh, the v- venture capital market is big. In fact, Finland, of all places, is a, ha- has the most venture capital per capita in Europe. And Portugal is quite high, too. Mm-hmm. So Central Europe, again, <laughs> is lagging behind and is investing actually more in traditional businesses like modernizing the auto business and so on. So I think that's something to, to be concerned about. Uh, I think that, uh, I don't want to speak to the regulation, let me just come with a, what I think would be a positive step. And the positive step would be to focus, and, and a positive step is that, you, uh, that Europe has decided to invest in, in you know, climate change and in, and, and in innovation and digitization. Uh, I would urge to focus some of that money around universities. Because if you look at the U.S., where are the centers of startup business? You know, it's in Silicon Valley. Take out Stanford and there would be no Silicon Valley. Take out MIT and Harvard and there would be no Pharma, you know, Valley here in, in Boston. So things happen around universities. And what's even more important to say, it's not driven by the research alone. It's actually driven very much by the undergraduate students. Those are the ones who start up businesses. And, and look at Silicon Valley and, you know, uh, 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 I, I'm sure you would agree with me. They, a lot of them are undergraduates, actually dropouts who didn't finish even their undergraduate degrees. And, and, and so uh, this understanding that it is actually the undergraduates should be in the focus here as a, it, it is, is a very important one, a message, I think, for, for Europe. Mm, thank you, Ben. And th- this is a very good transition with our uh, other guest, with our fourth guest, uh, Luke. Uh, Luke, uh, a quarter of a century ago, crossed the Atlantic. He was a fresh uh, uh, diplomé from uh, from a, a, a very well known French school, and and uh, went uh, to. Uh, I, was, I think it was you were maybe a trainee when you joined you joined Silicon Valley, right, Luke? And 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 uh, never come back. You're still there, 25 or 26 years later. What happened? And and what is your uh, vision? What's your analysis on on how things have changed over the the, the, the past few decades? And are you optimistic, uh, pessimistic? Uh, yeah, I'm very optimistic actually because I'm you know I'm always optimistic. So uh, I'm with, I'm not going for to... a French company now, so it's you better watch out. Yeah, of course. <laughs> uh, but but yeah, I'm very optimistic, and actually I'm not going to tell the, the the story or the history, but I'm going to come back to regulation because this is you know what we are talking about, uh, and really I mean um, uh, it's weird because uh, I'm seen as a pro-regulation guy, right? I mean uh, I'm an innovator, I mean uh, and so on. I mean I but I love regulation actually. I want regulation. I'm going to explain why. Um, so first of all, I'm going to rebound on what uh, Thierry Breton said. Um, in physical world, the, in the physical world, we are doing regulation. We have to regulate, and then we have to do the same thing in the digital world. That's totally true. I mean, we need to have you know some rules because otherwise, you know, it's going to be a mess. The issue, most likely, you know, in the digital world, is that regulation is not that easy because it's not you know a physical space that is in 3D, right? So, um, so the space that is oh. that is much more complicated to regulate, right? So, anyway, uh, what I'm saying here is that we need to regulate, but the reality is that in the digital world, because it's so complicated to regulate, it doesn't work very well to, for instance, you know. Uh, prevent Facebook or whoever, you know, whomever to, to, uh, to do something that we don't want them to do. And they are still doing it because they can go around, okay? But I think that regulation has one virtue that is actually very, very good. It's education. Because when you regulate somehow, 
you give the people, you know, some keys about what should happen and what shouldn't happen. You give them the rules. And so when they see that there is a rule, that there is regulation, they are wondering why it's happening. And then, you know, it's going to follow by having people saying, okay, if there is regulation, it's because, you know, there is something I shouldn't do. And they are going to ask for this thing that was in regulation. So actually, it's the reverse way, it's going to come from the people at the end of the day. And when you see, for instance, you know, the, the latest uh, Apple um, uh, OS, iOS, that is uh, uh, basically cutting, uh, I mean, doing some things that uh, G, uh, GDPR wanted to do, mm. I mean, it's coming from the people because people ask for it and Apple was smart enough in this case to you know, provide to the people what they asked to do. It wasn't because of the regulation. They didn't do that you know, in May 18 when the regulation came up. They did that uh, I mean, two years later because people were asking for it because the regulation had been made and had been taken back by the people. This is what I believe. Uh, maybe uh, Thierry Breton, do, do, would you agree with that uh, analysis? Is that also you, you, what, what you think on what Luke just said on, of course, Bank? Would you like to uh, react on that? Well, um, you know, first, uh, I, I really would like to tell you that uh, um, in order to proceed, um, uh, we have done the largest consultation ever, and not only in Finland, everywhere. We did the largest consultation ever for almost more than a year. We had 3,000 contributions from governments, NGOs, platforms, name it, they all answered. And we did something which I believe is pretty balanced um, uh, to make sure that we will do the right things. In order to do this, it's very, you're right, it's extremely complex mm -hmm. to, uh, uh, to, to think how to organize it. But we know that we have to do it. We are politicians. It's our job. It's not to put barriers, it's not to, it's just to give, I run many, many companies myself. You know what I needed, Ben? I needed to have visibility. I needed to know what I had to do and not to do, and then adapt myself. And it, it they don't exist in the digital space. We just try to give these guidelines. They're not too strong, they're not too tough, but that's our guidelines. And by the way, well, I would like to ask you one question. Because you said that. Who are you asking, uh, who are you asking uh, the question? Everybody or professor, someone in particular? Professor, oh, I have right. to ask okay. uh, our, our professor from the other, the, the other side of the Charles River. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, and, and uh, you know, you said there's no capacity for, for startups in Europe and so on. It's not true. Hmm. It's not true at all. Look at the crisis we are in. Come back one minute, if you allow me, on the vaccine strategy. This is a story of European startups. Name it. BioNTech developed finance in Europe with European money. Curevac, same story. Jensen, same story. Oxford, then get married with AstraZeneca, same story. On the fifth vaccines, Moderna, okay, was developed on a technology which was initiated in Europe, uh, in Boston. But not too far from where you stay, I know. Four of the five vaccines have been developed by startups or academic in Europe with European money. But it's true that thanks to American money, through the BARDA, we have been able to accelerate then the rollout of these vaccines, clinical trials, Mm. But not the science. It has been done in Europe with European startups. And that's a story that you need to have in mind. This is what's happening, I could tell you, on the ground. Another, another question. You mentioned SAP. SAP is not a platform business. It's a software company. The value of SAP is 139 billion euros, which is small. You know, another very important question European companies, which values in technology, is twice as big as SAP. Do you know it? Does anyone know this company? It is from very far <laughs> our most valuable European technological company. Totally indispensable for the digital space. Do you know this company? 
I would say Atos or <laughs> you know you know it because you were using it at Samsung. <laughs> Luke, it's called you... ASML. ASML is in oh ah, yeah. There's a world leader being able to make microchip down to two nanometers. Ninety-five percent of the market value two hundred and eighty. 218,000 billion. That's close to LVMH, by the way. Mm. So in other words, in other words, I know that there is this story, what you described. Mm. I see another one on the ground. But it's true that we are still far. It's true that we have to catch up. It's true that we have to accelerate. And my mission is to make sure that I will be able to provide what is needed for this energy, for these young talents to do exactly what they did in the digital space, like what they did in the pharmaceutical space. So let's, let, um, maybe we'll go back to Bengt, uh, for, because he had, as, was asked a question, and then we'll come back on, the, uh, on this side of the Atlantic with Jacques, who has also something to say. Bengt, do you want to react to the, or answer the, the commis, uh, commissioner's question? Yes, so uh, first, first of all, I did not say that Europe doesn't have any startups. I said that when they go exit, they go somewhere else often. That that's that's what that was my point. So it was a point of venture capital. I understand very well that the startup business in Finland, for instance, is, is doing very well in some ways. But it's still true that if if you ask an entrepreneur, does he or she want to want to sort of beam in Europe or go into Silicon Valley, they take the Silicon Valley money, mm -hmm. not because they have money. Because this is not at all about money. This is about contacts. It's about experience and so on that Luke can talk talk about. China is a different story, but they have their own model of it as, as well. So, so I don't think we need to argue about that. I think we need to ask. I think for Europe. And by the way, I'm totally European. I'm not an American citizen. Mm -hmm. So I I feel mm -hmm. like I have, have the right to engage in this conversation from the inside as opposed to outside. Sure. In that sense, uh, it, uh, I, I am worried about this, uh, dear. That's my. That's where I'm coming from, and and I would love to see Europe prosper, and and I think that Europe will be able to prosper, and that's why I suggested. You know, I'm glad that they are focusing on innovation. But to take another issue, which is big, what's so special about data is the scalability, you know, and the, the platforms and the scalability is the the big new things that come with the new technologies. And 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 this is this is why all, all these big companies that are so valuable are in this category, and 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 in that respect, payment systems turn out to be very important. For instance, so so for the for the Chinese experience, payment systems they really have only two private ones: Ali, Alipay and, and WeChat Pay. They are phenomenal, in con you know, phenomenal drivers of the ecosystem and the fact that they get the data mm. and process the data. So this is not just about having the data, it is actually about using the data in, in some efficient way. And it is here, for instance, where the PSD2, which is very well intentioned, uh, is just, I mean, we can't start arguing, but PSD2 is a pla it, it's meant to be a payment system, it's payment system directive, uh, you know, take two. And and it, it, it just, you, you, you know, it basically gives it to the individuals to decide how the data is used and also for banks to be sort of the, 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 the depositors or repositors of the data. And as an economist, I see a lot of free rider problems and other problems, you know, in terms of if you give it to the, which one is better, give it to somebody sort of a coordinating player versus, you know, give it to individuals. I, I think that's going to be a slow process and, and, and that's why we don't see as high valuations even among the, uh, among the big data companies in Europe. Mm, thank you, Bengt. Um, <laughs> Jacques, you wanted to react maybe on... The uh, yeah. on, on what the commissioner said, and maybe on what Bank just said. So, just two things. Uh, one thing on uh, on what uh, Bank say, and I've got a question then for the three of them actually. Uh, so, one thing on what Bank said about uh, universities, but I think it's a more general problem. I don't think that the, I mean, there is clearly a problem of funding 
of European universities. But right now, I would be very much against, for instance, funding huge amounts to French universities without a reform of a university so that they function. There's a structural problem which uh, has to be solved before you can ask our uh, you know, French people to put more money in that system. Mm. Uh, actually, I mean, when, when I hear you speaking, actually, I mean, you are putting different words on it, but you're saying the same thing. A bank is saying uh, Europe is uh, late and the commissioner is saying uh, Europe has, is doing things and needs to do more. So, you know, uh, it's uh, bonnet blanc, blanc bonnet, as we say in, uh, in French. Uh, so, uh, but, so, one thing which, you know, I, I would like you to discuss a little, no, which I think would be interesting for you to discuss a bit more is, what do you think are the priorities you know, f for European innovation, especially in the tech world. And in particular, I'd be very interested to know how uh, Luc uh, feels after now having put his toes back into a uh, French, uh, you know, European uh, industry. You know, what does he think is going well? What does he think? I mean, I'm not asking you for secrets, and I know it's a little bit uh, difficult for you, but, you know, uh, what do you think are the good points? What are the bad points? Uh, what should be done? I think Luke is very direct and cash. I think he can answer that question, right? Yeah, I can answer it. I mean, I, I, I won't give you any secret because I don't have any. But um, <laughs> but what I can say, I mean, is that as Thierry Breton said it actually at the, at the beginning as well, I mean, we have an incredible amount of very interesting things to do next. So uh, so we need, a, you know, a frame to do it. Uh, but once we have the frame, I really believe that... Uh, in France in particular, because this is what I can talk about, uh, we, we have a lot of very, very interesting things to do at the industrial level. We didn't dare, maybe, you know, not enough, but if I take the case of Renault, I mean, I really, really believe that we can transform Renault as a real digital company, right? I mean, today, it's obviously, you know, cars, it's, it's metal, right? But, um, but I really believe we can because there is a lot, a lot of data that can be uh, that can be um, uh, coming from those cars, from the people using the cars, and mm. from from all that, all that. So, so there is something to do. But I mean, we need a frame. We need to be sure that we are going to do it correctly, and we need to be sure that this data we are not going to give it to anybody or anyone, you know, without any, uh, uh, you know, money back or something. Mm. So, so th that's something that is, I think a, a strength that we have in all the, in all the old industry in Europe. Mm -hmm. Thierry Breton, uh, is that uh, since you 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 have I, both? I, no, I 100% agree with um, uh, with uh, uh, what uh, Mr. Julia just said. 100%. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, we are here to do more. Of course, we want to do more. By the way, I agree also with Mr. Kramer when he says that uh, don't put money in French university before before a big reform. So that's <laughs> I think mm -hmm. you're. You're absolutely right, and uh, and and I'm sure you have you have a good idea what what to do here, but still, um, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, I, I I organized, if I may say so, our European our uh, European uh, single market in fourteen ecosystems, just to make sure that I will be able. It was very important for me, by the way, during the crisis, because uh, these ecosystems are you can you have the the one from automotive industry. You have the one from tourism, you have the one from retail, you have the one from defense, you have the one from pharmaceutical industry. And of course, in these ecosystems, you have big companies, but you have a lot of small companies, medium-sized startups, innovators, academic re research centers. I put all this in mm. these ecosystems. And you will be amazed how vibrant it is, how dynamic it is. And they all understand, they all understand that it will come with data. And with exactly what you said, industrial data. So then, of course, and of course, automotive industry, by the way, it's funny because um, we were thinking in the past century that we're not thinking. We, we, we realized in the past century that automotive industry was driven innovation. And then we thought at the beginning of the century when we, when we, when we heard all the platform, they're saying, we are doing everything, you're, you're dead. That's okay, automotive industry is dead. And now, look what mm. automotive industry is still driving big time the innovation. Here again, so now I understand why you're back in, in, in an automotive industry coming from, from, from Samsung. But still, my point here is that we will generate data like never. 
Today, the planet is 40 zettabytes of data. Most of them are personal data. During my mandate, it's four years. It's four years to go still. We multiply by four. Most of them, it will be from 40 zettabytes to 175 zettabytes. Mm. Most of them will come from industrial data. And this is why we want to organize here, we call this in, in the Data Governance Act, just to organize mm. in the car industry. You have data which are extremely important for you. You will never share it. But you have data that you provide, your, 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 your data your connected car are providing probably 30 petaoctets of data per day. That's a lot. You have now in this, in, in your cars, you have supercomputers now. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Ten years there were HPCs. And of course, these data, you will be probably happy to share this with your peers because then you will be able to create innovation. So we are working on this to, write, to have the right data pool on a voluntary basis, allowing to share and to create innovation. So we are doing a lot of things here. But don't it's you not to get regular. It's don't just organized. Can I speak to this? Yes, I mean, sure. I'll I listen want, yeah, to I this. wanted to give you the, of course, go, go ahead. Thanks. Yeah, well, this is very important that I think the mindset in, from my perspective is, is not the right one. I mean, you, you take, I understand that you're thinking that you need to orchestrate the whole thing. But I tell you what, businesses are very good and very central in orchestrating things, both by agreeing with each other various things and also especially organizing, for instance, ecosystems. You just, why do you think that the ecosystems in the United States have grown so big and why they are equally big in, in Asia? Is that because the government has actually organized and orchestrated it or maybe it is because the government has not touched it? I mean, there is a problem with size, there is a problem with privacy, but to argue that the government has to somehow tell how these kids will play, play in the sandbox seems to me an error in mindset. It's not, uh, it's not, you know, you, I can see, you know, I can see privacy a big issue, but, 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 you know, that, that I, that's, that's something that I, I actually think it should be handed to the government. So they, they should supervise it in some manner rather than letting individuals doing it for the individual, so to speak, represent the individuals. But in terms of how you organize ecosystems and so on, I mean, the evidence is just obvious. It is, it, it is that companies can do it very well themselves. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and they understand how to what we call internalize externalities. Just look at, I mean, have you been in, have you been in China recently? Uh, of course, I think there's a big misunderstanding. <laughs> We are not organizing the ecosystem. The stakeholders are organizing it. Big misunderstanding. Okay, so we what are, not, are you, are not, are you organizing? We organize ourselves to follow this ecosystem, which has been fully organized, not by us, by the companies. Mm -hmm. I run companies all my life. I know exactly what you're talking about. I'm, I'm here as a commission by accident. I'm <laughs> the first CEO being, being, being a commissioner. So I'm an accident of history. <laughs> this is why, believe me, I'm 100% with you. And I'm avoiding, of course, <laughs> my, my people to do what you say. This is, again, in the hand of the stakeholders. But guess what? Before I joined, my DG for internal market, it's called DigiGo, was organized exactly like you said, in a communist country. <laughs> and I said, look, Let's ask the industry how you want to organize themselves. They came back with 14. Okay, fine. <laughs> Who are you? We are big companies, small companies. They claim, great. How do you want to organize yourself? Let us do. But now organize yourself to be our counterpart. This is what we do. Mm -hmm. We are doing exactly what you do. And you know what? It seems to work. I, I, I disagree with both last statements. I don't think it's working as well, and I don't agree that, that that's what you are doing. I mean, PSD2, for instance, is a good example of a, something that I think is a big issue, uh, and, 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 you know, how well it is. And actually, the UK, UK is using it the best way, better than anybody inside the, the EU. Uh, UK has, has, has I'm not private to the details, but they seem to have been advancing them, advancing the, you know, make, made use of, of the PSD, the, the payment system platform. But uh, 
I, I think Europe could do. I mean, I, th I think it's important to get the right mindset here. And, and uh, I, I, frankly, I really don't understand what you mean by, that, by saying that you are following the business. You know, it, 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 it seems to me that there are fairly serious constraints on the business uh, that's, that, that you are putting in. I mean, conditional on things having gone the way they have been going. So, so uh, that, that, um, that's hard to, hard to ag agree on that when you look at the United States and, and, and uh, even China. Yeah. So at the, well, at the end of the day, you talked about China and the U.S. It's the same situation in the U.S. Um, do you first need to regulate, and then do the company uh, let the company org organize themselves, or, or, the, or, or the contrary, just do let the company organize themselves and then regulate? I mean, when you see what's happening in in the, in the U.S. and in China right now, it seems like the the authorities are, are trying to, to, I mean, to calm down all these, all these big tech giants, right? Uh, Mr. Botton, you want to maybe to rebound on what's uh, Mr. No, no, that's true. That's true. I am in contact, of course, with my counterpart in the U.S. and it's extremely interesting with what we are doing because we did it again, bottom up, starting by the business, as I said, with the last consultation. It's not at all uh, what has been described. It's absolutely not a top-down approach. Absolutely not. Uh, um, we are business. We, we are business-oriented people too, so we know this extremely well. But on the other hand, we need to adapt ourselves. Let me give you an example here, uh, which has nothing to do here again with with uh, with uh, data governance, but still not too far. Uh, I have been in charge also, as you maybe know, of the uh, vaccine uh, uh, delivery in the in, in the EU uh, since the beginning of, uh, of February. In, uh, it has been painful. You know why it has been painful? Because um, we had absolutely no, um, uh, no, no, no obligation in our ph pharmaceutical industry. Of course, uh, there are some things which are, it's, 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 it's an industry which is, for health reasons, organized and regulated. But we were open to everyone and so on. And we had many supply chains everywhere in the world. May, most of them when, were in the U.S. And the U.S. took an executive order. They decided that not one single vaccine will leave the U.S. until you get herd immunity in the U.S. Mm, mm. And that is so that not one single component of the vaccine will leave the U.S. And I have many companies, European companies, having subsidiaries in the U.S. being totally blocked. I try to engage and so on, and, then, and we were free. We are open. We are an open continent. Impossible to discuss with my counterpart, Jeff Zayens. And then we decided to put a tool regulate, saying now we will control. I hate to do this, but I had to do this, to be able to get the vaccines for our people. And I said, look, everything now which will leave the Europe will need to have our approval, at least for the next six months. And guess what? I started to enter into discussion with the US. They are still closed. Mm -hmm. They are still don't send one single dose outside of the EU, but at least I can reopen the supply chains, and that's an example where regulation, forced regulation, mm -hmm. allows us now to be the first continent in terms not only of discovery vaccines, but producing vaccines. That's just an example of sometimes you need to adapt yourself, even if, like me, you are not for regulation, for regulation, but you just need to adapt yourself. And, you know, let's now think in the digital world, we will not regulate, we just need to adapt ourselves to this new world. That's it. But let's try to do it with everyone together. And you know what? When I'm discussing with all my friends or former friends, when I was a CEO <laughs> of the digital environment, they understand very well what we are doing, extremely well. Mm. And to tell you the truth, they're quite supportive. So you're talking about the, uh, about the American... Not, I will not tell you this way, but I, I know. You're talking about Google and Facebook and all, all, all these guys, or...? Of course. Yeah. We did show them. You know that it's public. <laughs> I think Jack wanted to intervene. With that. Yeah, actually, oh, except if uh, Luke wanted to say something, because I... Uh, mm. but, but maybe one case study to uh, go a little bit uh, further on this is the... Uh, on, on, given that we are speaking on data, uh, and I know that the Commission has been very, very active on uh, trying to... Uh, promote uh, uh, European data space and so on, and have you know, uh, been discussing that uh, also. 
the, you know, one of the big infrastructure of the next uh, 10 years, which is going to be very important for data, is cloud computing. Mm. Uh, cloud computing right now is dominated by uh, three uh, American companies, uh, mm -hmm. Amazon, uh, uh, Google, no. uh, Microsoft, Microsoft and, uh, and, Google. And, and, and Google, who actually have been, I mean, the way, uh, we've been brilliant in the way in which they've uh, developed this. Uh, so, without even thinking about what do we need to do now, you know, given, given the importance of data, what went wrong in the fact that this new industry, you know, this new way of computing, which was created in the last, basically developed in the last 10 years, Why is it that it's three American companies who are totally dominating that uh, market? I mean, mm -hmm. and, and, you know, what does it mean? I mean, does it mean something in terms of our systems in Europe? And what do we need to change uh, for that? Question. Yeah. Luke, you want to take that one? Yeah, I mean, I, for me, that's pretty clear. I mean, it's a question of capital, right? I mean, uh, the capital that was invested in those three companies that you are talking about, and they were not small companies when they started that, yeah. right? I mean, they were already very established company with a lot, a lot, a lot of money. And to create clouds, basically, you need to get a lot, a lot of money uh, and to create you know, those big infrastructure without any return uh, for a long time. So uh, so that that's, that's the main issue is that maybe in Europe or even in Asia, maybe, I mean, even though in Asia they had those companies and they did create their own clouds because they didn't accept to get any other clouds from anywhere else. But anyway, so maybe in Europe, we didn't have the, the capital to uh, to just back up this kind of infrastructure and this kind of business that would be long-term businesses. No, no, we, we, I mean, we have a capital. We, we are not a poor continent. Uh, why doesn't our why isn't our capital put to that use is the real question, it seems mm -hmm. to me. It's all, let me, can I say something? Yes, I mean, this is a typical answer. This is a typical comment, you know, in the sense that, you know, U.S. has the money and, 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 and this is about universities often. But why, are, why do they have the money? It's actually a sign of something that's working. And, 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 and you know, it's, it's, it's employing the money, just like Shaq said. You know, there is the money here, but it's not being put mm. into the use that, that uh, apparently it should be. Uh, so I, I I think I think that uh, that I think really needs to rethink this whole thing. They, uh, let me say that what is happening in China and US is very different from each other. They are very different in terms of the system. And I'm not suggesting we would go in the Chinese direction, but we could still learn some things from China. That's for sure. But the key thing is that they both sides have left these companies to innovate. They have not started with regulation because it's so uncertain. Data is a totally different animal to regulate than, you know, a traditional, because it's a non-rival good, as we call it. It's, you know, who should own it? You know, can we put, we can't even put, you know, quantity constraints on data because data, the value of data has to do with how it's used and it can be duplicated and so on. So it's a... It's a totally different world, at least for an economist, to be looking at that. And and they have let these markets work themselves out, or, or the systems, I should say, rather than markets. We maybe China left let the Alipay and uh, and and Tencent do what they pretty free hands to do. And by the way, other companies also. But now that they see what's happening, and I I when I look at you know the bigness of companies. In, in the United States, I think they need to climb down on them somehow. That's that we have now seen how it plays itself out. So now we know, I think we are in better position to regulate in some manner. But uh, I think my concern is that when you don't, when you are entering this totally new business, you have to be flexible. And I don't see the way, the way uh, you see it, Mr. Breton, That, that somehow the system in Europe is very flexible. It has taken a long time to get here, there for obvious reasons. I'm not mm. criticizing because Europe, Europe is a collection of countries. It's not like United States or China, single countries. So there are a lot more challenges in Europe. But the fact one has to be willing to recognize these challenges, it seems mm. to me. Otherwise, we are not going to get, you know, to... To, to, to a speed of development that uh, I, would, would, uh, I would like to see. Thank you, Bengt. Uh, we only have a few minutes to go, and I would just have 
you know, to make a last uh, round of, uh, around this table uh, uh, of, you know, your feeling. Get, let's go just beyond regulation, right? And, and see how you, uh, optimistic or pessimistic you are about Europe in, the digital, uh, in this digital arena. Uh, Luke, let's start with you, maybe. Uh, as the ex expert in uh, artificial intelligence, what, what are the chances of Europe and France to, to, to succeed in that, uh, in that scene? Yeah, so I mean, I have a very optimistic view again, you know, for the French, uh, for the French technology there, because I mean, uh, frankly, today and tomorrow, uh, AI is just about mathematics, right? And we are one of the best uh, people, mm -hmm. best, you know, country in mathematics in general, we can count that with the middle, the field middles, you know, that we're getting. But anyway, so I really believe that our engineers, and, and we talked about education before, you know, and we said that it's not very good, blah, blah, I don't know. Mm -hmm. But I mean, what I see, actually, is that it's pretty good. All the engineers yeah. that I see, you know, coming to my way, or that I'm hiring, you know, in both sides of the, the Atlantic. And uh, when there are French engineers, I see that they are very, very good. So I really believe that uh, our education system produces some very good people to do specifically AI. And that's why, you know, I'm optimistic uh, that we can uh, have a lot, a lot of good companies. I mean, now a lot of those companies, the startups that we are creating in France, I mean, for the past, I mean, almost 10 years now, uh, they are actually producing and using those new talents, you know, in a better way than it was 20, 30 years ago, I think. So I, I think it's changing. And I think that for the, um, specifically the startups, the talents in the startups and AI, we, we have a big, big chance uh, on the French side. Mm. So how is the French uh, economic professor seeing uh, the future on that, <laughs> on that topic? Uh, I'm not sure. I'm in the middle. It can go both ways. So mm. uh, just one thing, because I mean, it's such a big question that I can't speak about everything. I've been working quite a bit on uh, the DMA and trying to understand, you know, what's behind it and the theory behind the DMA and so on. And it's clear that the DMA has got some uh, very good components uh, and has got some aspects you know, which I find a little bit uh, more uh, iffy. And... Whether or not it's, and very, lots is going to depend on the implementation. Okay, mm -hmm. so I think we, uh, you know, so we are speaking about the regulation of platforms in particular. I think Europe has set up some regulatory framework, but regulatory framework live, live. I mean, they're not just rules, they have to be managed and so on. And I think that lots of what's going to happen in the next 10 years is going to depend on the way in which we, we, we manage those. Uh, those regulations, and that's going to be a really interesting ride to, mm. uh, to, to, to follow. Bengt, uh, I'm sure there's still something uh, optimistic in you about Europe, deep inside. I, or, I'm very <laughs> optimistic, like Luke, on this new technology, and I'm excited about it. I mean, I'm following it. It's fascinating. It's absolutely fascinating. But one has to understand that in order to turn it to economic benefit, you need organization. And what we are debating here, in some sense, uh, is how much should be government, how much should be private. And that boundary is hugely important. But where do you draw it? And, and uh, my comment is that, that I, I, think, I think you should give, the, give more slack uh, to, the, to, the, to the companies in the beginning uh, because, and invest in training of entrepreneurs. entrepreneurs Entrepreneurship in in US by this data that I gave you mm. is not you know what it could be in my view. So that that's that's it's all about organization because there is nothing wrong with the intelligence in 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 Europe. They are just as just as intelligent as the US or more so. You know it, the question is how do they organize themselves and and is it the government or is it the private side and and where where the boundary goes and for my taste. Boundary is not right right now. Mm -hmm. And 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 with you, Thierry Breton, you'll have the last word. Uh, and uh, you know, it's an interesting one. I, I think <laughs> it will be definitely a, a pre-COVID and a, 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 a post-COVID situation yeah. uh, because the um, U.S. government never put, and by the way, some in Europe, but not at, 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 at uh, not like the U.S. government, as much money in private company uh, like ever because of the crisis. And, and it's funny because uh, um, uh, we, 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 we are now in a situation where, where, where we see, because of the crisis, government's putting a lot of money, 
a lot of money in companies directly or indirectly. A lot. By the way, level play, uh, including in China also. By the way, the level playing field here will be something to watch very carefully. And for somebody who made also all his career organized in the private sector and uh, running companies, uh, this is a little really scary. And that's a big difference between US and Europe. We are lagging behind. US in injecting tons of money, yeah. public money, in private companies. Let me give you one example, uh, just to end, because it was one question which was raised. <laughs> Why did you miss the cloud? It's a good question. Yeah, yeah. Because of course, they had the infrastructure, because they had the data, because they had to build the servers, because they had to do it for themselves, for their own needs. This is how they built uh, AWS, by the way. Uh, you, we know the story. And, uh, and, um, and that's why they have been success, successful, which is not exactly the, the, the case of, on, on Google Cloud when they wanted to start from scratch. Mm. But still, uh, uh, and now they all understand that the next fight will be in industrial data, with industrial cloud, with different, very different KPIs, very dif different latencies, mm -hmm. very different cybersecurity constraint, and no one adds this to the market. So. Pentagon launched a big call for tender. And look, this is what I, ne I, I need. Only European, uh, US companies were allowed to, uh, to bid. Fine. I, I respect this. And I can understand. Mm -hmm. um, two of which, AWS and Microsoft, fighting like hell. Because that was so much money given by the Pentagon for this. Finally, you know the story. Microsoft won. AWS is swing it. So, you know, that's the new world. Mm. A lot of public money, just for American company, which is good. I don't criticize, but this is what happened. So now, what was my answer? Mm. My answer was, okay, look, let's have all the players from the industry, they met. What do you think as a constraint? What exactly you need in terms of uh, um, industrial cloud? What is your requirement? And they work together Mm -hmm. As they have their own KPIs, they have their own, they have their own tools. And now we are using what of our, what of our uh, capacity to do it openly, but to invest also with member states to do a little bit what the U.S. is doing for our own companies. Okay. Well, thank you very so much for this. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Thierry Breton. Thank you, Bengt. And thank you, Luc. And uh, on the other side of the Atlantic, uh, merci, uh, Jacques. Thank you to you all. Stay safe. Uh, et uh, merci uh, à tous de nous avoir suivis.